And we turn on our judicial candidates forum to Mike Clark running for this uh, common police court seat. And uh, we have a number of questions. They will be the same questions that each of the candidates gets. And so we'll get a series of answers and uh, it'll be up to you as the listener to decide uh, the candidate that uh, most appeals to you. Good morning. Good morning, Todd. It's good to have you with us here this morning. And uh, let's get right to the questions today. And uh, we'll start with this one. It's an introductory type of question. What are the one or two things that you feel the voters need to know about you and your judicial philosophy as you approach this seat? That's a great question. Um, I think probably the the thing that I would want voters to, to know about me would be my experience and the fact that I have a little unique experience compared to the other candidates. Um, you know, when I was in um, college, I started off working on weekends in the – actually – in the summertime, I started off working in uh, the county jail as a corrections officer. So I've had a little insight from the, that perspective as to our judicial system. After college, I went to the police academy and worked with the uh, county uh, district attorney's office as a county detective and worked on the drug task force. And I think both of those things, along and then in law school, I worked with the Michigan attorney general's office and Pennsylvania attorney general's office in Harrisburg. So I think along with the, those qualities or, or those those experiences, give me a, a unique insight into the system that the other candidates don't have. And I think that's important for people to understand that that's kind of what's developed me. You know, when I, I talk to people, they, they say, how do we um, how do we know who to vote for and how do we know who, pe- you know, what each person stands for? And I always think that you have to look at what has shaped that person, their life experiences. And I think those life experiences for me – have helped shape me and kind of bring me to where I am today. So, This particular scene on the Court of Common Pleas has traditionally been dedicated to family-oriented cases. Now, how would you like for the court to be defined moving forward? For the role to be defined? Yes. Um, I think when I've talked to the court administrator to try to get an, uh, an idea as to what the court's position is on how, what this new, new judge will be doing, um, I think – the message I get is a judge is a judge is a judge, meaning that in Indiana County, our judges uh, can hear any type of case. And uh, I think that would be a great role uh, for the, for this new position, that you can hear anything from a criminal case to a civil case to a uh, family case, family law type case, all of which I have experience with. Um, I think the best thing we can do is to help alleviate the, the backlog of cases in Indiana County. And I would think the best way to do that is to work with our president judge and Judge Bianco to, to find out what they need to alleviate the pressures that they deal with on a daily basis. We're talking with Mike Clark, one of four candidates for the Court of Common Pleas here in Indiana County. In your experience watching judges conduct court proceedings, what are some of the more difficult aspects of being a Common Pleas Court judge here in Pennsylvania? Some of the most difficult aspects or more difficult aspects. I, I think when you live in a small community, um, some of the difficult aspects are that you're oftentimes dealing with issues and um, people that you may see on a daily basis or issues that may be affecting your family or affect somebody that you know closely. So I think that, you know, when you're in a, a small community like Indiana, that oftentimes issues and people or people that you would run into, and I think that makes it difficult for a judge. Okay. Um, when you have uh, seen some of the most recent uh, decisions coming down, there have been some Supreme Court rulings in recent years that have affected sentencing guidelines uh, for both juvenile and adult cases, uh, and cases for which a juvenile has been tried as an adult as well. Do you favor mandatory minimum sentences in cases such as that? I think good, great question. Uh, I think my view on sentencing is that's a decision that the legislatures deal with and debate. Um, my favor, I, what I favor is that we give discretion to the judges and to the people that hear the cases. I think every case is different, um, and each case and the sentence imposed has to be based on the facts of that case and the laws that applies to that case. And I would hate to do anything that would take some discretion away from from the courts. Um, we could probably debate for hours as to whether or not mandatory minimums are a deterrent to crime or not. But ultimately, I think it should be the judge's uh, decision as to how to, once somebody, if they're found to violate the law and, and they need to be held accountable, 
it should be the judge's decision on how they to to um, what sentence to impose. And I would hate to take anything away from that judge in making that determination. You know, I believe people need to be held accountable for their actions. And I've talked many times on this. <clears throat> I think that uh, in in Indiana County and in Pennsylvania, there's two major deterrents to crime. One is that there needs to be a certainty of punishment and that punishment needs to be delivered swiftly. Certainty of punishment and punishment delivered swiftly. So I think that's a judge's job to to listen to the facts of a case, to make a determination, make sure our cases move through the system quickly and swiftly, but fairly, and that you the judge has the opportunity to hear the facts in the case and then let the judge make that determination as to what the right sentence is. In cases such as those uh, that I just mentioned uh, and in others, uh, a higher court, superior court, state supreme court, uh, could reverse a judicial decision that has been made in the Court of Common Pleas. How would you feel about that should one of your decisions be reversed? You know, I've come to respect the process. I've had cases who that I've taken to the court and tried in court here and, and, and been in front of the judges and have had cases go my way and cases go the opposite way. Ultimately, you have to have respect for the process. Um, I'm sure if I make a decision that would be overturned, probably would not be happy, but I would respect the process because that's the process we have, and, and, and you have to respect it for our system to work. We're talking with Mike Clark, one of four candidates for the Court of Common Pleas in Indiana County, and there is one position for which voters will be uh, uh, voting uh, coming up on May the 16th. Uh, should there be a specific court for specific types of cases. I'm talking about cases involving veterans or, or cases uh, involving a specific type of crime, such as drug cases. You know, we have a drug court now that deals with uh, drug cases. And um, one of the things that I've proposed uh, to to maybe help the process would be a veterans court or a mental health court. Um, you know, we we send people off to war and join our military and they sometimes are involved in some of the worst things that we can't even imagine and they come back to our our country in Indiana County and have to try to integrate themselves into society and sometimes that transition is not easy so I think it's important that um, we provide an opportunity if they get into trouble that they could go into a program where they have a mentor that uh, is focused on maybe um, issues that they've dealt with to help them uh, resolve them uh, being in jail might not be the best solution. Um, rehabilitation may only occur if they have somebody who knows what they've gone through, so a mentor through the you know the military uh, process. Um, I think it's a good thing. Uh, it's not always the right solution. You know, when you – rehabilitation, you know, working as a corrections officer, and, and then I've been the solicitor for the Indiana County Jail uh, for quite some time. I've seen that the inside uh, and how things work from the jail's perspective – um, there's certain people who rehabilitation is a, is a great thing and an option. Um, sadly, though, there are certain people who rehabilitation is not an option and they just simply need to be locked away. So you know, I think there's certain cases where uh, a specialized court would be beneficial, but it's not going to work for everybody. What, in your opinion, are the factors uh, that must be involved in approving a plea bargain from, from the judicial position? It's a great question. Um, I've heard a lot about plea bargains when I've been out talking with people. I get it that plea bargains are a necessary part of the process. The issue that comes up with me is that victims have an input, have input into the plea and into the deal that's made. Um, that's one of the big issues. I would want to make sure that victims have a say and approve and understand the options of the case, meaning what if the plea doesn't occur? What if the plea occurs? What's the dif difference in sentencing? Um, I've also had the, lots of people tell me that the police officer wasn't consulted. So I would want to make sure that the police department, whoever the uh, affiant is, has the ability to have say, a say in the process. And I would want to make sure. In fact, I've told, I've told victims that I've talked to and I've told police officers that I've talked to. If I'm elected as judge and a plea comes in front of me, two of the qu first questions I'm going to ask is, what does the victim say? What's the victim's position on this? And what's the police officer's position on this? I think those are two of the most important aspects of the plea. Um, I think it's also important to look at what type of case it is and what happens based on the plea with sentencing. 
back to accountability. I, I think that, you know, if we want to get a handle on the crime problem, we need to make sure that people are accountable. If pleas are starting to be made that would um, impact sentencing, reduce sentencing, I'm not sure it's holding people accountable. So those would be the things that I would look at. As a judge, would how active should you be in seeing the way that a course is progressing and recommending to one side or the other that they pursue a plea bargain? Is is that a role that the judge should play? Yeah, I'm not sure that it's a role that the judge should play. I think the judge's main job is to to look at the facts, look at the law, and make a decision. And I'm not sure that a judge's job is to to run the case from that standpoint either. I mean, that's we have a DA. Um, and that's the DA's position. But I do think it's important that a judge make sure that the cases are, are being resolved resolved appropriately and people are being held accountable. We're listening to Mike Clark talking about the position of the Court of Common Pleas, for which he is one of four candidates. Should the courts play a more active role in addressing the opioid crisis? And what might that role be? That's a tough one. Um, it's another, that's one of the big issues I hear from people when I'm out uh, talking is how do you address the opioid problem? You know, the drug court that Judge Martin has uh, implemented has been a good program. Um, I'm not sure there's a simple solution to it. There's a lot of different theories and ideas on, on the best way to, to resolve it. Primarily, I think from the court's perspective is that we have to be focused on listening to the facts and the issues from each case that comes before the court. Um, I would be in favor, and I've said before, that people who deal illegal drugs, people who deal heroin that cause death or injury need to be held accountable. So I think a court can make sure that that happens. Um, I also think there's an opportunity, uh, everybody involved in, in uh Heroin is not a dealer, and some people have uh, an addiction that need, they need help. So I think as a, if the court finds that the person has violated the law based on the facts and the circumstances and they end up in jail, we can make sure as part of the sentencing that they receive the appropriate uh, counseling. You know, Indiana County has some great counseling uh, social service agencies here. I've said from that I would have a, a list that I would keep on the bench beside me that would have a list of all of our local social service agencies and say and look at that list every time that somebody's involved in the system and say what agency could help this person because what we don't want to do is if they end up in jail if they don't give the right treatment or the right counseling when they walk out they're going to be back to where they were before so I think from a court's perspective we can make sure that you know um, they receive that counseling or we get them referred to the right places. Might not be the best setting here. I only have uh, just a little over a minute left with you, but I just want to toss this one out to you. While the opportunity might be limited on a county level, what are your thoughts on judicial activism versus strict adherence to what's the written law? I'm, I'm focused on strict adherence to the law. I don't think judges, if I, if I understand your correction, your question, I don't think judges should make, be making the law, um, I think that's up to our legislature. You know, we have Dave Reed, Don White. Um, those are the people who make the law. And that's based on they deal with the constituents on a daily basis. They find out the issues that need addressed or the laws that may need to be uh, implemented or modified or amended. That's up to them. I think from a judge's standpoint, you look at the law that's written, you look at the facts, and you make a decision. Mr. Clark, thank you. Thanks, Todd.